This is session A2, Physics in the 1800s. Last session, we did an introduction to the lecture series, but did no physics. So today will be the first lecture with some physics in it. Today, we'll explore five areas of physics discoveries from the 1800s. Some of them directly contradict or are inconsistent with classical physics and will eventually lead to quantum mechanics. Others are areas that we need in future lectures. There will be some breaks throughout this lecture, so you can stop the lecture and pick it up at a later time. The first area that we'll look at is absorption and emission lines of light. In the late 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton used a prism to separate white sunlight into its rainbow colors. And he could use a second prism to recombine them and produce white light again. You see that the, the prism causes the violet light to bend sharpest. Blue less, green less, yellow less, orange lea less, and red least. And those are the colors of the rainbow. By around 1814, a German physicist and maker of lenses and optical instruments, Fraunhofer, had developed a modern spectroscope, which divides light into its various wavelengths, but the spectroscope gave much better resolution of spectra than just a simple prism. You will also see the word uh, spectrograph for a device which not only separates them, the frequencies, but records them. Here's what the solar spectrum looks like. This is a, a modern uh, capture, not one of Fraunhofer's original captures. So the horizontal axis is wavelength of light in nanometers. Nanometers are 10 to the minus ninth meters, so billionths of a meter. We normally consider the visible spectrum to be between 400 nanometers, which would be violet, and 700 nanometers, which would be the edge of red. However, different people have different eyesight. So some people can see a little bit beyond 700 or, be, or beyond 400, and other people cannot see a, as well. And it changes some with our age. Wavelengths higher than 700 nanometers, longer than 700 nanometers, we call infrared and wavelengths shorter than 400 nanometers, we call ultraviolet. Light was later understood to be electromagnetic waves, and wavelength is the repeat distance of a wave. So there's two aspects, maybe three aspects to this. One is, beyond, you know, outside the visible range, we don't see much color. Maybe we can barely see some of these lines, but we really can't see any color here and here. The second thing is, in the visible range, we see this nice continuous band of color. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, green, blues, violet. And then the third thing is, there are some lines some wavelengths whose light from the sun we are not seeing. And this is interesting and amazing and needs a, needs a physical explanation. Fraunhofer was able to map over 570 of these lines, 
So some of them are much fainter than we're seeing in, in this uh, image. But Fraunhofer did not have an ex a physical explanation for what the uh, dark lines represented. There would be partial explanations at different times in the 1800s. But a good physical explanation for the lines wouldn't come for a hundred years, around 1913. We're going to look at what physicists in the 1800s had discovered and, and knew about these lines. This is a possible time to take a break. This image was from the sun. The light from the sun comes to us from a layer that we call the photosphere. And the temperature of the gas that's emitting the light that we're seeing in this image is about 5,800 Kelvin. If you, if you don't know the Kelvin temperature uh, scale, um, that's fine. It's not important. Uh, don't worry about it. The black lines are called absorption lines or Fraunhofer lines. And we're going to look at those lines for the remainder of this section, the first section of this lecture. So Fraunhofer dis discovered them around 1814. And around 1859, there was a new discovery relating to them. Two German physicists, Kirchhoff and Bunsen, discovered that lines could also be produced not by absorbing sunlight, but by emission from heating elements on Earth. This, the, you might know the name Bunsen if you've ever taken chemistry. This is the same Bunsen who invented the Bunsen burner used in chemistry labs. This image, there are, there are two things in this image. To the, on the left side of the image, we can't really tell here, but this is a, uh, a glass instrument with, with a low pressure gas in it. This is a long section of, of the glass tube. And then there's this end, and there's an, an end on the bottom that we're not seeing. What would happen is, at the top and the bottom, a large voltage would be applied to the gas. And it would ionize the gas and cause the gas to glow. In this case, this gas in the tube is hydrogen. And we would describe this color as pink or light red. But what the section on the right is showing is this is that light split into its individual wavelengths. So we see a strong red wavelength, a strong but maybe less strong uh, aqua wavelength, and a, a less intense blue wavelength. What Kirchhoff and, and Bunsen determined is that several of the Fraunhofer lines from absorption lines from the solar spectrum coincided, they had the same wavelength as emission lines identified in the spectra of different heated elements in the lab. You either could take a, a, an element uh, like a, a solid and heat it and look at the light, or you could take a gas and put it in a tube and um, electrically ionize the gas and look at the light. So heat it in a flame or ionized in a glass gas discharge tube at low pressure, high voltage, like 5,000 volts. The 
high voltage dissociates molecules into atoms. It ionizes the atoms, so we get a plasma. And it that ionized plasma um, emits light um, of a color that depends on the gas and gas or gases in the tube. You may be familiar with neon lights, neon signs. Those are those have the gas neon in the tube. Um, this example is hydrogen, which we're going to focus on. This is a possible time to take a break. For hydrogen, we call the visible light emission lines the Balmer series of emission lines of hydrogen atom. We call it that way now because of a discovery by Balmer that we're going to cover in just a little bit. So we don't have, we don't call it the Kirchhoff and Bunsen uh, lines. Uh, we call it the Balmer series. Here's a better, sharper image of the Balmer series. The red line, the aqua line, the blue line, and here we see a violet line. And also, although this is in the ultraviolet, on this image we can see a violet line. So this, these are all part of the Balmer series. It starts with red and moves left. There are other lines that we cannot see here um, and we're not going to be worried about. We're going to primarily look at the first four lines, the red, aqua, blue, and violet. These hydrogen emission visible spectrum lines in the, in the lab are called right to left. Hydrogen alpha or H alpha, that's the red one. H beta, that's the aqua. H gamma, that's blue. H delta, that's violet, and so on. But we're going to stop at, at the fourth one. If we were to go back and look at the Fraunhofer uh, spectrum again, we would see we can't exactly tell, but but they are exactly the same wavelengths as CFG and little h on the Fraunhofer spectrum. C, F, G, and little h. So this means that in the layer of the sun that, that generates uh, all the light we see, there is hydrogen in that layer. That was not known before. It is, but being able to map it, match it up to a spectrum in the lab allows us to see elements in that layer of the sun. This is a possible time to take a break. The light that we see from the sun, almost all the visible light, comes from a, a layer of the sun called the photosphere. This is a hundred kilometer thin layer of the sun. A hundred kilometers is very small compared to the size of the sun. So it's a very teeny layer. It's an outer layer of the sun, but not the outermost layer. We call it the photosphere. Now the sun is a gas. It's a high temperature gas. The temperature and density of the gas are highest at the core of the, the, the sun and decrease with distance from the center until we get to this photosphere. Below the photosphere, the density is high enough that photons definitely get emitted because it's high temperature, but they also get absorbed and they get absorbed below the photosphere, so we never see those photons. Those photons don't leave the sun. They cause a, the, a lower layer of the sun to heat a higher layer of the sun. But we don't see those photons. We 
say that the lower layers of the sun, which is really almost all the volume of the sun, those layers of plasma are called optically opaque because photons don't travel very far before getting absorbed. And so they, they look, so they're not transparent. The photosphere is the layer that we do see. The plasma has a lower density in the photosphere than the layer below it. And it, it's the photosphere is the point at which the density is low enough that it becomes optically transparent. And almost all of those photons can escape. And we see them. Photons emitted at the inner layer of the photosphere, that layer is 6,000 Kelvin. Almost all of those escape, and we see those photons as sunlight. However, the outer layer of the photosphere is 4,500 Kelvin, cooler than the inner layer. And so some of the photons that get emitted at the 6,000 Kelvin inner layer get absorbed by the cooler layer. This gives us those black dark absorption lines. The cooler layer is absorbing photons that were emitted by the, the hotter layer, but only for specific wavelengths which physics will need to explain why that happens. Different absorption lines for different element atoms are present in the photosphere. We figure this out by matching up the lines from the solar spectrum with the emission lines in the laboratory by, by uh, producing the spectrum of each element on Earth in the laboratory and then comparing it with the solar spectrum. And scientists did this and many of the, uh, almost all of the um, solar absorption lines did have a counterpart among the known elements on Earth. But they did find some absorption lines that did not have a counterpart on the Earth. And rather than throwing up their hands and saying, well, I don't know what this is, they proposed that those lines were an element that had not been discovered yet on Earth. They named that element helium for helios, uh, uh, I think a Greek name for, for the sun. And then they set about looking for that element on Earth and they found that element on Earth. But it was first discovered in the absorption spectrum of the sun. Helium is a gas, a noble, uh, noble gas. It's lighter than air. So it, it goes to the top of the atmosphere. It has low mass. When, when heated, its thermal energy is sufficient to achieve escape velocity from the Earth. So at the top of the atmosphere, it actually escapes to space. So it doesn't build up in our atmosphere, which is that and the fact that it's a noble gas doesn't chemically combine with other elements is why it wasn't detected earlier on Earth. But it is present on Earth if you know where to look for it. And we'll talk more about that later. This is a possible time to take a break. Other elements in the sun. From the absorption lines, we know that the sun, that the photosphere of the sun, the cool part of the, the cool layer of the photosphere of the sun, 
contains hydrogen atoms, helium atoms, carbon, oxygen, neon, sodium, magnesium, calcium, iron, mercury, and other elements. Not all in the same amounts, different amounts. Our sun produces helium in its, in its core. It burns hydrogen to helium. But the helium that we see in the, in the absorption spectrum, that's actually primordial helium that's been around since the early minutes of uh, our universe. Mostly. But the other elements, carbon, oxygen, neon, and so forth, those are not produced in our sun. So the fact that they're in the sun's photosphere means that when our sun was formed four point something billion years ago, it was formed of material in our solar system that was mostly hydrogen and a lot of helium, but also had these other elements in it in very small amounts. And those all came from other stars that had exploded in the past in our galaxy. So novas and supernovas, other stars and galaxies. Fraunhofer actually, after he found absorption lines in our sun, in our sun he pointed a telescope at the star Sirius, which is a bright star that we now know to be hot, hotter than the sun, and produced an absorption spectrum, and some of the lines were identical to the sun, and others were different. Ever since then, this has been an important tool for astronomers to find the chemical composition of other stars and uh, the spectrum can also help tell us the temperature of other stars. Some other stars in the Milky Way are older than the Sun. They are more original, more primordial. They, they always contain hydrogen and helium, but when a star has much less of the other elements, astronomers classify it as older or primordial. We, we can tell from absorption spectrum whether that star is moving toward us or away from us and what that relative speed is. This can be used to tell whether a galaxy like the Andromeda galaxy is rotating or not. I really should say how much it's rotating because galaxies are rotating. So we could tell the rotation velocity of galaxies. We can also tell whether galaxies are moving toward us or away from us. And all galaxies that are not very near to us are moving away from us. And the further away they are from us, the faster they're moving away from us. And this is the expansion of the universe since the Big Bang. And astronomers m measure a lot of it using absorption lines, just as, as Fraunhofer did. This is a possible time to take a break. Here are the modern values for the four um, longest wavelength Balmer series lines, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, in nanometers. Balmer was a Swiss mathematician and at the, at the age of 60, he decided to take these four numbers, 
and see if he could find a formula that related them. He was less interested in the physics that produced the, the uh, absorption lines or emission lines, but he was just interested in the numbers. And he was able to find a formula that related these four numbers. And we call that uh, Balmer's formula. So the wavelength is 91 nanometers divided by this expression in the denominator. 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over n squared, where n equals 3, 4, 5, and 6 for the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta lines. We could turn this into, Balmer's formula was in terms of wavelengths. We can turn that into frequencies of light if we want by using the formula that frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And if we do that, we get a frequency formula, which is 3.3 times 10 to the 15 hertz times this expression, 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over n squared. This formula, these formulas, these Balmer formulas, are going to be important to the development of quantum mechanics. This, the Fraunhofer line should have been a wake-up call to physicists, physicists. Why should there be discrete frequencies in classical, for, in classical physics? Why should light be emitted or absorbed at those wavelengths? What does this form, what produces this formula? Why is this the right formula for hydrogen? For the visible lines of hydrogen? This would finally be explained in 1913 by the Bohr model of hydrogen. And that would show that new physics is required which will become quantum mechanics. So it took a hundred years from the time that Fraunhofer first published his Fraunhofer lines in the absorption lines of the solar spectrum till there's a, a physical model that explains these numbers and this formula. And even then, it would be another 12 years before there was a better physical explanation, which would be the beginnings of quantum mechanics. This is a possible time to take a break. Next, we're going to look at electromagnetic waves. The ancient Greeks knew a little about electricity. They could produce static charges with... Um, fur and amber, but, but they couldn't really use electricity in any way. More and more came to be understood about electricity in the 1700s and 1800s. Charges came as positive charges and negative charges. Charges could exert forces. Opposite charges attracted. Uh, same charges uh, repelled. Interesting effects happened when charges were in motion. So we had currents. We could have magnetism. We could have static magnets. Moving magnets could produce currents in wires. Varying currents could, in, could produce magnetism. A lot of effects were explained and formulas produced in the 1700s and 1800s. These, and it was clear that 
charges and, and magnets could affect other charges and matter at a distance. And this became explained in terms of electric fields and magnetic fields. It's not important if, if you are not familiar with them. Um, you'll still be able to get the thrust of this lecture. So formulas were developed for how electric and magnetic fields uh, interact with one another and are produced by charges and magnets. In the mid-1800s, Maxwell produced his set of equations, which we now have in a more compact form called the four Maxwell equations. And Maxwell took those equations and said, what would happen if, what do these equations predict if there's no matter? Can there be electric and magnetic fields in space with no matter? And he found that yes, there can be certain kinds of electric and magnetic fields. There can be electromagnetic waves in space, in vacuum, with no matter. In 1864, he determined this. The waves cannot stand still. The waves travel. Electric and magnetic fields will be varying in, in space, sinusoidal in space, and time they will travel at some propagation speed. Maxwell's equations produced a numerical speed and said all electromagnetic waves propagate at that speed. When Maxwell computed that number, it turned out to be the same as the known speed of light. The speed of light had been approximately known in Sir Isaac Newton's time in, in the uh, late 1600s and had become better known in the 1700s. Light was, was known to be or thought to be a wave phenomenon, but nobody knew what it was a wave of. Maxwell proposed that since the wave propagation speed from electromagnetism corresponded to the known speed of light, that light was probably an electromagnetic wave, just with smaller wavelengths than, had, uh, than any other form of electromagnetic wave that had been understood. So Maxwell proposed that light is electromagnetic waves. And we will use that fact. We're, we don't need to know everything about electricity and magnetism and electromagnetism. But you do need to know that light is electromagnetic waves. This is a possible time to take a break. We're going to need to know a little about electromagnetic waves. We don't need to do the math of them at this point, but we need to know a little about them. So I'm going to describe more about electromagnetic waves. I'm going to simplify it when we can. We're going to talk, so light is, so electromagnetic waves are what are called transverse waves. If the direction that they're propagating is the z direction, then the, electro, the electric field is not in the z direction. It is either in the x direction or the y direction or any direction in the xy plane. 
but it's not in the direction of travel of the wave, so not in the z direction. It's a transverse wave. Water waves are also transverse waves. The ripples are in up-down direction and the propagation is along the surface of the water. The simplest kind of electromagnetic wave to talk about is a plane wave. In a plane wave, the entire wave is traveling in one direction. We'll call it the Z direction. So everywhere in the universe, this wave is traveling in the Z direction. That's an oversimplification, but it, it makes the math easy to deal with. Another simplification is that we're only going to talk about plane polarized plane waves. In a plane polarized plane wave, one direction is the propagation direction, we'll call that Z, and one perpendicular direction, we'll call it X, that is the direction that the electric field points. So at all points in space, the wave is propagating in the z direction, the electric field is in the x direction, and the magnetic field is in the y direction. The electric and magnetic field vectors are perpendicular to one another, and each perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Here's a picture of the sine waves of that are the amplitudes of the electric field versus position. Position is going left to right, and the top wave, the one in red, it is a sine wave from trigonometry, a, a sine wave, S-I-N-E. If you're not familiar with sine waves in trigonometry, just you see that it's a, a wave that goes up and then down and up and down, and it repeats. And it has a repeat pattern from here to here that is the wavelength. And it's in all space. I mean, it doesn't just start here. It goes all the as far to the left as you want, and it goes as far to the right as you want, because we said that it's a plane wave that exists in all the space. Now, it, it moves in time. It keeps the same spatial pattern, but the pattern moves in, in time. I mean, it moves in space in time. So what was here at time t equals zero moves to here at time t equals capital T over four. So what was zero here moves, moves to there. What was a peak here moves to there. And it moves steadily from left to right as time goes from t equals 0 to t equals t over 4, 2t over 4, 3t over 4, and finally t, where t is the period, the amount of time it takes for one wavelength to propagate. We see that after from t equals 0 to t equal big T, the wave looks like it has returned to the original point. This is a traveling sine wave. And we're going to consider that this is a sufficient explanation of electromagnetic waves. This is a possible time to take a break. I'm going to give some formulas. You don't need to know them all, but you need to know a, a few names of things. The electric field is a vector. That's what this little arrow on top of it means. It is a vector whose uh, amplitude can uh, could possibly 
uh, vary at different points x, y, z, and at at different times t. But in this case, the plane polarized plane wave that we're going to consider, the electric field is always pointing in one direction, the x plus or minus x direction. The peak value, the amplitude, peak amplitude is always the same, absolute value of e, but it varies in space and time as a sine wave whose argument is a, a phase phi of z and t. This phase phi of z and t, it has three different equivalent formulas. We can write it as k times z minus omega t 2 pi times z over lambda minus f t or 2 pi over, over lambda z minus c t where lambda is the wavelength, it's a length, f is a frequency in hertz, cycles per second, c is the speed of light in vacuum or in a material like air or, or, or glass. We have this formula relating wavelength and frequency, these three equivalent formulas, that the wavelength times the frequency equals the speed of light. So if we divide, we can find that the wavelength equals the speed of light divided by the frequency, or the frequency equals the speed of light divided by the wavelength. They're all equivalent. K here, we call wave number, and it's 2 pi over lambda. So it has units of inverse length or one over length. We see that here we have kz and here we have kz. So k is 2 pi over lambda. Angular frequency omega is 2 pi times frequency f and it's in radians per second. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. You, you won't need it. Important takeaways here are in green, that an electromagnetic wave has a wavelength lambda, which is a length. It has a frequency f in cycles per second, and that these formulas for, for finding how um, the wavelength and the frequency, finding one from the other. Now the magnetic field will be perpendicular to the electric field, so in this case, Since the propagation direction is z and the electric field is, in, is pointing in plus or minus x, the magnetic field is going to point in plus or minus y, and it's going to have an amplitude, and it is also going to be a sine function with the same phase function. So when the electric field is peak, the magnetic field is peak, and so on. We're not going to, we're going to, it's going to be sufficient for us to just be interested in the electric field, the magnetic field always does the right thing in relation to it. So if we describe the electric field will be good. This is a possible time to take a break. So here's a here's a representation of an electromagnetic plane wave simplified, plane polarized, a single wavelength or frequency and a single phase. Propagating left to right on the z-axis, the direction of, of propagation, it's propagating at the speed of light. I'm showing the electric field direction along the x-axis in green. The electric field is a sine wave Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. This is showing what this electric field sine wave looks like at time t equals zero. I'm showing one sine wave, but this is the electric field at all points in space, x, y, and z. It's not just the, the value on this line. so. It has the same value 
in any xy plane. So if we if we take the xy plane for this value of z of z, where the electric field is at its peak at time t equals zero, then it's gonna then everywhere in that xy plane the electric field is going to point in the same direction and it's going to have the same value everywhere in, in that plane at that time. Now the magnetic field is along the, the plus or minus y axis. It is this sine wave the re in red plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. And that's the magnetic field at any point in XYZ, it, it also has the same value in any XY plane for a particular Z in a particular time. So this is a representation of a plane polarized plane wave, a single wavelength and a single phase. Here is a GIF of an electromagnetic plane wave, a traveling wave, in this case traveling in the y-axis. Red is electric field, blue is magnetic field. Now real light all around us is more complicated. It does not have to have a single direction for the electric field, which is to say it does not have to have a single polarization. It doesn't have to have this single phase, it doesn't have to have a single wavelength. So if, we're, if we look down the z-axis and, and, and say, well, what's the direction in the xy plane that the electric field is pointing? Our example showed this green up and down, but the electric field could point in any direction. We only chose a simple case of pointing in one direction. Light could, cons even light of the same wavelength and frequency it, it, there could be different light beams of different phases, which I'm showing here as different colors. So they have different orientation in space and time, even though they have the same identical shape. Light can have different wavelengths. Here I'm showing three examples where the wavelength is pretty close. So they look the same here, but by here they're spread out. Here's a different example where they're quite a bit different. And then here's another one that's higher frequency. Light doesn't have to propagate in any particular direction and, and the light around us propagates in all directions, multiple directions. And if we have two electromagnetic waves, then any linear combination of them is also an electromagnetic wave. So here's a weird combination of different sine waves. And that's, that's a perfectly fine electromagnetic wave too. You can see why we want to simplify and just consider a sine wave. Light does not have to be plane waves either. It can be spherical waves also, waves that start at some point in space and propagate out as spherical wave fronts. That's perfectly fine too. We're not going to treat the mathematics of it. Now, Maxwell proposed electromagnetic waves propagation in 1864 and a German, Heinrich Hertz, discovered them experimentally in 
1886 to 1889, he showed that he could have a spark in one place and that it, it could produce a spark a little distance away. Later, other people, including Marconi, developed this engineering to produce the wireless telegraph, which eventually was able to allow ships at sea to communicate with shore. And later, the engineering was further refined so that we ended up with radio, the transmission of speech and music. We will need to use electromagnetic waves at other lectures, which is why I gave you this short understanding of what electromagnetic waves are in this lecture. This is a possible time to take a break. Now we'll talk about the discovery of X-rays. German scientist uh, Röntgen um, published the first paper written on X-rays in 1895. He called them X-radiation. His colleagues called them Röntgen rays. You, you still will see them referred to Röntgen rays. Um, but generally we refer them to them as X-rays. Let's look at his setup. In 1895, Ronchen used a particular um, Crookes tube setup, and I'm showing it schematically here. The Crookes tube is a uh, glass tube, glass enclosed tube, with a low pressure gas inside the tube. One electrode called the cathode or the emitter, I'm showing here on the left. Another electrode called the anode or collector, I'm showing here on the right, and I'm showing it angled at like a 45 degree angle. And that those two electrodes would be connected to an external DC high voltage source. And in this case, it would put a positive voltage on the anode. This high voltage source would be like on the order of 5,000 volts. And uh, it will ionize the gas. And let's, let's see how that happens. The gas is initially mostly neutral. But there's always some uh, ions in the gas. So there's always some cases where the positive ion has separated from an electron. We don't yet know it's an electron, but an electric, uh, a negative electric charge. And when that happens, the electric field um, between the positive anode and the negative cathode causes positively charged particles to go to the left and negatively charged particles to go to the right. And they pick up energy for, as they move through the electric field. When the positive ion smacks into the cathode, some electrons from the cathode, negative charges, will be uh, liberated uh, ejected, and, and once they, they leave the cathode metal, they then will go left to right toward the positive anode, and they will pick up high energy. Some of them may smack into other ions, neutral, I mean, other atoms, neutral atoms, and when they do, they'll ionize those atoms 
and very quickly almost all of the gas will be ionized and there will be a lots of electrons in the gas and the electrons will be going left to right and pick up high energy from the 5000 volt potential smack into the anode metal and what will happen is they cause x-rays to be generated the, the high energy electrons smacking into the metal x-rays will be liberated and in Ronchin's setup the glass tube is surrounded by cardboard but the x-rays went right through the cardboard and they were detected on a fluorescent screen some distance away. So he had detected x-rays going through cardboard. He had produced x-rays in this Crookes tube, produced them, they passed through the cardboard, and they were detected on the fluorescent screen. He since they could go through cardboard, maybe they could go through human skin, and he actually took had his wife put her hand in a, a setup, and he photographed his wife's hand in x-rays, showing the bones in her hand. He published in 1895. This became so exciting that in 1896, there were over a thousand articles published about x-rays. But interestingly, it wasn't, Ronchin didn't invent x-rays. It turns out, looking back in history, they were first produced in 1785, 100 years prior, and they were produced at different times by different experimenters, but they had not published, and they, they realized that something was going on, but it didn't interest them enough to uh, do the experiment as clearly as Ronchin did, and then Ronchin published. But even famous uh, electrical uh, experimenters and inventors, um, Faraday in England and Tesla in the United States, they both had uh, found that photographic plates could be exposed n near a Crookes tube, but they did not do the experiment quite the way Ronchin would that proved that the x-rays go through cardboard and are produced by the Crookes tube. X-rays are electromagnetic waves. When you produce the x-rays, the x-rays are no longer affected by electric fields or magnetic fields. They don't you can't bend the x-rays after you produce them. X-rays are electromagnetic waves with shorter wavelengths than ultraviolet. This is a possible time to take a break. Radioactivity. In 1896, the, the French um, scientist Becquerel discovered that Uranium salts could blacken a photographic plate that was enclosed in paper. Something from the uranium salts passed through the paper and blackened the photographic plate. This is a very this is a similar effect than uh, Ronchin's X-rays. Um, 
but it was eventually discovered that this, this is not x-rays at all. It's a different thing. Becquerel found that uh, uranium element also could do this. And Polish scientist Marie Curie, married to French scientist Pierre Curie, living in Paris and working in Paris, Marie Curie isolated a new element, radium, from uh, uranium ore, pitch blend ore, in 1989. Radium was far more radioactive than the uranium, which is how she was able to search for it and isolate it. And the high radioactivity of radium will prove useful in science, and we will see that in a, in a later lecture. It was Marie Curie that proposed that when these radioactive decays occur, it is one an atom of one element changing to an atom of another element. We will talk about radioactivity again in another lecture. Discovery of the electron. Electrons were discovered using a Crookes tube, a different setup than the, than the diagram I gave you. In, in a different setup, scientists were able to see that coming out of the cathode and either hitting the anode or if we move the anode, if we move the anode, the cathode rays can shoot right by and hit the glass. Um, there were these, there was something happening in the gas, some electrical phenomena that was called cathode rays or Leonard rays. Leonard was a German physicist and he had a lot of uh, uh, inventions uh, regarding the Crookes tube, one of which was to put a thin aluminum window to, to remove some of the glass of the Crookes tube and put a very thin aluminum foil window there so that it could still support the difference in pressure between the outside and the inside. But the cathode rays, some of them could pass through the aluminum foil and strike the outside air. In 1897, English scientist J.J. Thompson proved that the cathode rays were negatively charged corpuscles. We now call them electrons. They, had the, they could be moved by an electric field consistent with being negatively charged. They could be moved by a magnetic field consistent with their being negatively charged. He was able to determine that the electrons were about a thousand times lighter than a hydrogen atom. He was able to determine it by having the electrons go through a Leonard window into the air and seeing how far they went in the air and how much energy they deposited. And he was able to tell that they were far lighter than the hydrogen atom. So atoms were divisible. This is the end of lecture A2.